Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Happy post-Thanksgiving. How's everybody feeling? Are you wearing your stretchy pants? <laughs> I don't blame you. I'm like, where's my biggest shirt? Where are my biggest pants? And you know what? Um, it's, wonderful to, it's wonderful to be with family, isn't it? How many of you enjoyed time with your family this last week? I, my mom is visiting from out of town. This is my mom, Pam Shirtliff. Mom, raise your, raise your, wait, there you go. <laughs> and my dad wasn't able to come visit this, uh, this time around, but my mom was able to come visit, and it was just delightful to have her here. And we were able to eat our Thanksgiving lunch, or the supper, with uh, Tria's parents up in Apollo Beach. And they're not that far away. God could have sent us a long ways away, but we're literally only 15 minutes further from her folks' house than we were before. Well, that's not too bad, right? Dear ones, I am so excited. Speaking of family, we have a new sister in Christ. Nia, go ahead and take a stand real quick. I'm going to help you. You're like, Pastor, why are you you're making me move? I'm nine months pregnant. <laughs> Folks, I want you to take a good look. This is your sister in Christ. Amen? Amen. And she's about to have a baby. Now, now I, I'm, I never had a baby, but my, my wife gave us a child. And I can tell you that in the last, it's my son's 10 years old, in the last 10 years, the greatest privilege of my life is to be a, be a parent, but it's also probably the thing that causes me the most grief, okay? So, so brothers and sisters, how many of you are parents out there? Anybody? Listen, pray for her, will you? Support her. You know, let's get some free babysitting going. Let's, let's take care of this, this precious, I mean, don't get me wrong, you got, you got mom here and grandma here, but we want to support you, amen? And we're here for you. This is your baptismal certificate, and I just want to see, do we have a motion to accept Nia into the, the poor Charlotte SCA church? Is there a second? Yes. All in favor say amen. amen. Amen, brother. You got it. You got it. That's the spirit. Here is a beautiful gift Bible. You probably have one, but I love this version. The NLT, very easy to read. Please enjoy it. And just recently, someone donated. I'm, I'm tempted to say who, but I don't know if they would want me to. Someone donated some really fancy shampoos. Ready? I think, is that, is that, is that right? Uh, where, where are you at, sister? I think this is a shampoo. Is it shampoo? Body wash? Okay, so now you know. It's Nikki Long. And what is it? It's, it's philosophy. By a friend. But let me put it this way. How many of you have ever used philosophy? You really? I haven't. You have? My guess is that you take good care of yourself if you use this, because I'll tell you what, if it's not made by Procter & Gamble and have Old Spice, I, I can't afford it. So this, <laughs> this... This is, hot. this is fancy. And the reason we're giving it to you, sister, is because the blood of Jesus Christ, the most expensive thing in the cosmos, is what was poured out to clean you. Amen? So you've been forgiven of all your sins. And when you use this, just remember that something far more valuable than this, although this is pretty expensive, <laughs> was poured out to forgive you of your sins and to secure a place for you in God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. All right. And let me share with you just my favorite Bible verse. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. There is nothing on earth that can keep you from heaven. God bless you. Amen. All right. You know what? I turn around and I have a pulpit. It's fantastic. Whoever did that, thank you. <laughs> Y'all are wonderful. I just want to say uh, thank you to all the folks who put our church, who work so hard, um, to do what they do. I want to thank the Long family for that beautiful worship. Were you blessed? I want to thank Gabriel. You know, Gabriel, you know, <laughs> I whispered in his ear earlier, I do not want to serve a perfect church. I don't. A perfect church is an exacting church, a church that gives you a hard time when you, when you trip up and fail. I don't want to serve an a perfect church. I mean, I want to become perfect like Jesus, amen? But this side of heaven, my guess is we're going to make mistakes. I'll tell you what I want for a church family. Humble, hardworking, and loving. Amen. Give me that church, and I will be thrilled. Amen? Amen? Listen, brothers and sisters, if you want a perfect church, you need to start the, the pastoral church committee back up again, and you need to, need to let me go, because I'm not perfect. <laughs> but it's enough to be humble, hardworking, and loving. And you're not even that humble when you say you're humble, so just, <laughs> just, just saying. God bless you all. And Gabriel, I love, I love the way you serve the Lord. Keep, keep it real, and uh, we appreciate you, brother. All right, dear ones, I'm trying to think, is there anything else before we get in? Is there anything else? I don't think so. Let's have a word of prayer, and let's get into God's word. Are you ready to study God's word? Yes. Do you believe that the God's truth can set you free? Yes. Do you believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? Yes. 
Are you ready for your faith to grow strong? Let's pray. Oh, loving Heavenly Father, you're an amazing God. Your word is like that. It's, it's like the blood of Jesus. It has power. It does things for us that we cannot do for ourselves. And so now, Lord, as we gather to study your word, start with me. Have mercy on me. Give me the ability to share in the power of the Holy Spirit, a power that is not mine, nor can I take any credit for or glory to myself. Thy will be done in the, this church family. Thy will be done. These are your people. This is your word. This is your Sabbath. Lord, fill us to the brim and overflowing. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear ones, if I say the name Jim Elliott, how many of you know that name? Jim Elliott. Now, I see a hand back there, a younger hand. Wonderful. You know, missionary stories have always really affected me. What, does, does anybody know the name? Um, oh, well, let's, go, let's come back to Jim Elliott. I'll, I'll share with you in a minute another name. But Jim Elliott, if you know Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott was back in, I believe it was the 50s, he and his group of his friends felt really called to serve in a place called Ecuador. Anybody ever been to Ecuador? I had the privilege of taking a team of missionaries from this church to Salinas, Ecuador. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful area. And, uh, but it was right there on the beach. But Jim Elliott and his friends, they went to Quito, and they started learning about the, the local languages. And when they were ready, their goal was to, be, go, to, to live among and to go among the Aka people, A-U-C-A. And you know what Aka means in the Quechua language? I believe it's the Che. Let me check real quick my notes. The Che Quechua. Quechua. Quechua, I'm guessing. Quechua language. You know what Aka means? means? Take a wild guess. Somebody guess. What do you think Aka means? What is it? Water? Nope. It's a, it's a specific tribe, the Aka people. What is it? What do you think it means? Savages. In their language, they were the savages. You know, depending on how uh, even blind you are to the reality of this world, you know, you can think someone's a savage if they don't have a college degree. You can think, you know, back in the Bible days, and I don't feel that way, by the way, nor should anyone else, but in the Bible days, the, the Jews called the Gentile. That wasn't, Gentile was not a nice term, do you know what I mean? The, the Greeks called everyone else barbarians. That's not a nice term. But the people in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian people themselves, called this tribe in the jungle the savages. And what do we know about them? Well, they didn't, you know, people didn't speak their language because anybody who ever tried, and the oil companies that were down in Ecuador and drilling for oil, they kept losing oil workers because the Aka tribe, the savages, would kill them. You couldn't, you couldn't work in the jungles because they, they would kill you. They carry these long, long spears. And so there's this man, Jim Elliott, and he's a missionary, and he starts talking to his friends, and he loves Jesus, and he studied at Wheaton, and he became convicted that God wanted to use him to bring the gospel to far-flung areas of the world, specifically Ecuador, the savage tribe, the Aka people. How many of you have ever felt called? Amen? Can you imagine being called to serve people who are known murderers? Nobody goes there and survives. I don't know if you read, read in the news a couple years back, off of uh, the, this still happens today, off the uh, continent of Africa, or maybe is it, is it, or the country of India, maybe it's off India, the, the Sentinel, North Sentinel Island. Did you get anybody? There was a missionary that went to the North Sentinel Island. He never even got out of the boat. He was killed. Some of these folks are so insulated, and they, they, don't, they don't know, they don't trust the outside world, and they probably have good reason, but they, but they would kill you just as soon as talk to you. And yet Jim Elliott felt called to serve these people. So Jim and his friends, they go down there, and what they did, and I'm just going to share a little bit of their story today for sake of time, they had an airplane, a little piper, and they would fly it in a circle and have a long rope. And if they flew it in such a tight circle, they could let down the rope and there could be a gift basically in the center of that circle. And the, the Indian tribes, they would come out there and they'd get, they'd get gifts from, from Jim and his friends. And it was, thank you, brother. You're the best. So thank you. So he, he would drop gifts. They would, give an air, they would give a little model airplane. They'd give food. But let me ask you a question. Could someone receive the gift of the model airplane and still not understand who Jesus was? Could someone receive food or tools or something really handy but still not understand the gospel? What was it going to take to bring the gospel to the Aka people? Was it, was it, were gifts enough? It was going to take boots on the ground. It was going to take someone willing to greet, meet, and greet. And so that's what they did on one fateful day. Jim and his five friends, they landed the plane on a, on a, uh, 
a beach right there outside of the jungles or where the Aka tribe lived. And they stayed there for several days. And for several days, they started having inter interactions. And at first, it was going well. They named one of the locals George, and he came back, and they shared, and they ate together, and they were talking back and forth. But what do, what do people, apart from Christ, what do they inevitably do? When you don't know Jesus, and sin is reigning in the heart, and God's love is not there, what inevitably happens? That comes out. Sin is a condition. It's a terrible condition. You don't have to live in the jungles of Ecuador and see it. We see it in the news all the time, don't we? We see it here in, in, in Charlotte County. We see, this condition is not unique to the savages of Ecuador. <laughs> There's plenty of savagery in all of our hearts, amen? And so what happened was Jim and his friends were trying to share the gospel, but something happened, there was a misunderstanding, and in, in the end, all five of them were killed. You remember the story? All five of them were killed. And you would ask yourself, and many probably did, what was the point? What was the point? Jim Elliott, he had a degree from Wheaton. He and his friends, they spent so much time, so much resources. They were young and married. They had kids. And all these men went and died before they ever baptized and made one, even before they even got the words, Jesus Christ died for you, out of their mouths. They were killed on the beach there in the jungles of Ecuador. Well, put a pin in that. Think about that for a moment and come with me in your Bibles to John, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the word, who is the word? Remember all the other words, the, synony the synonyms that the Bible gives us in John chapter 1? It, the light, the life, right? He's the light that shines in the darkness. The word is the, the life of men. He is, he is God. The word became what? The word became flesh. God became flesh. You know, it was dangerous for Jim Elliott and his friends to become residents of those, that particular jungle in Ecuador. But Jim Elliott and his friends were following a playbook that was created by the Creator Himself. Amen? When the Word became flesh, think about that. God could become anything, right? I mean, He could, he could literally do anything. He could send, and He did send. Did, did, did God send before Jesus became flesh? Did, did, did God send uh, 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 disciples and apostles and prophets? Were there messengers that came to the earth? Did Noah preach for 120 years? Did Moses bring the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel? There was a lot of people that loved the Lord that brought a message, but it was an incomplete message. And many people misinterpreted them, so much so that we've already read that when Jesus came into the world, the world didn't even recognize him. His own people, his own flesh and blood, who were looking for the Messiah, didn't recognize the Messiah in him. And the Bible says the word became flesh. Listen, I get excited when I think about the flesh becoming like God, amen? With an incorruptible body. I wouldn't be excited if I had an incorruptible body and then I became susceptible to cancer. I became susceptible to pain, to suffering, to indignity, to unkindnesses, to, 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 to words and to actions that would hurt the heart. I would not be thrilled to that, about that. And yet the Bible says, and the word God became flesh and did what? Dwelt among us. Dear ones, Today we're looking at a section in John, and this just blows my mind when I think about it. God could have judged us from heaven. If God's intention was to destroy mankind, he could have sat on his throne and sent an army, or even just said the word, and the words when he said, let there be light, he said, let there be death, and humanity and earth would be no more. But in order to save mankind, he would have to send the word to become flesh and dwell among the savages, the murderers, the hateful. Dear ones, <laughs> I've thought about this, and it's a hard illustration because we're not ants. We're made in God's image. But can you imagine saving an anthill by becoming an ant? You can see the water. You know, you're a human being. You're six feet tall or whatever. You can see the water. It's coming. It's going to flood the anthill. And, and they're not going to listen. You don't speak their language. They don't recognize you. They don't care what you have to say. You're a big, scary human. And they, they bite you. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to become an ant. And you become an ant, and you try to convince them, we've got to find a different anthill, right? 
Wouldn't that be ridiculous? How many of you would raise your hand if, if your child could save an anthill? How many of you would say, okay, that's a worthy use of my son or daughter's life? None of us would. And yet the God of the cosmos, the creator of heaven and earth, that we have no telescope, even though we sent Artemis to the moon recently and took incredible photos, and we have these incredible uh, techniques and, and tools at our disposal, we cannot find the end of the cosmos. We can barely see outside of our own solar system. Brothers and sisters, God became flesh. The word became flesh. I understand that we're more than ants. The Bible tells us as much, that we were made in God's image. But the difference between us and an ant is, is less than between us and God himself. Amen? And the, amen. And the, the word became flesh. I love that you're listening, buddy. Keep listening. And the word became flesh and dwelt not apart from us, you know, when we went to Ecuador the last time, we stayed in a pretty nice hotel. But just outside of the hotel where we were, um, if Leah Huff was here, she could testify, we walked among homes. That all they were were chicken wire with wet paper, paper mache, dirt floors. They had one bed, and the family members, in order to sleep, they had to rotate through that bed. People, somebody was awake all night long. Somebody was working just to keep that little hut hovel home together. Brothers and sisters, the Bible doesn't say that God dwelt in the, in the four seasons. The Bible says that he dwelt what? Among us. Dear ones, how many of you have a less than ideal home situation right now? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody where you're struggling with having people over at your house because of what the storm did? Anyone was like, this is not the year to have the family come, right? And yet God sent his son... To, to become flesh like us, flesh and blood, susceptible to pain, subject to death, and need to dwell among us, not apart from us, but to be in the heart of what's going on. I love this passage. It really helps me understand that who God is. May I ask you a question, dear ones? Have you ever felt like maybe God's not fair? Have you ever felt like, why is this happening to me? Does God not hear and see? Have you ever felt, have you ever had questions about who God is? Have you ever wondered, like, why does this happen to me and it doesn't seem to happen to anyone else? Have anybody? Nobody? Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me that struggles with my faith. But sometimes I, I have a hard time worshiping God. I have a hard time trusting God because sometimes I see evidence that makes me feel like I can't. And you know what? That's a lot of the Old Testament. If you just have the Old Testament and you don't read the New Testament, there are sections of the Old Testament that it's hard to trust and truly love that God because it seems as if he's out there to destroy people. Is that fair? And that's why God said, mm -mm, they have not seen a good enough example of who I really am. I mean, Moses was excellent. Noah was wonderful. But, they, but they're lacking. They can't quite... They can't quite show the world what it needs to really see. And so the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace. What is grace? You know, <laughs> sometimes, how many of you have ever felt like you did something you shouldn't have done and you deserve to be punished? Anybody? Sometimes I'm like, kids, stand back from daddy. I'm pretty sure God's going to strike me with a lightning bolt, right? I know better, but I screwed up. But the Bible says Jesus is full of grace and truth. Moses' law taught an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You, you do the punishment, you, you, know, you, you, you do the crime, you do the time. It's equal, it's fair. But Jesus is not full of justice. He's not full of fairness. He's full of grace and truth. You kick him, and instead of him getting to kick you back, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Full of grace and full of truth. When they cursed him, when they nailed him to a cross, he didn't say, <laughs> I'm coming for you. Give me a couple thousand years, and when I get a chance, I'm going to nail you to a cross. He says, Father, forgive them. He was full of grace and full of truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is of he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. This same John said, I am not worthy to even unlatch his sandal. Listen, in the, in the Jewish culture in the first century, shoes and feet were very dirty, right? 
The lowest of the low in the house was the one who takes the shoes off and washes the, washes the, the feet. That's why when Jesus did that for his disciples, that in that culture was like, this should not happen, right? And that's why Peter was like, don't touch my feet. Uh-uh, I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, if I don't, you're going to have no part of me, right? Brothers and sisters, John, who Jesus would later say, and we're going to read it, of, of men born of women, no one is greater than John. And John is saying, I can't, I'm not even worthy to touch his dirty shoe. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. John says, this is, this is the real deal. This is what the world has been waiting for. And verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. What does that mean, grace for grace? Think about that. Do we talk like that? Grace for grace, gifts for gifts. What is the Bible saying here? You'd have to go back to the original language. That's what I did. It helped me. Charis, anti charis. Someone's like, anti, what does that mean? Well, it's the same prefix that we use when we describe the Antichrist, right? That prefix, that, that, that preposition, anti, means in place of or opposite of. And, and when we use the term grace for grace, charis, anti charis, what it means is wall to wall grace. Grace on this side of the building, grace on that side of the building. Wall-to-wall grace. Grace upon grace. That's amazing, right? The Bible says of Jesus, and we have, of his fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. Why is that important? Well, Nia, you just got baptized. Today we're celebrating God's grace in your life, amen? He's looked past whatever faults, and you, believe me, we're all human, so we have them. I'm not saying you have any more than, you probably have a lot less than me, Right? But in God's grace, he's forgiven, amen? He's forgiven. He's wiped the slate clean. He wants, he wants Nia, he wants you, he wants me in his kingdom. But we need wall-to-wall grace because if God only gave me grace to get inside the family and there was no grace to stay inside, I'm in trouble, amen? I need grace at that step, this step, that step, and one day at the end of my life, I'm going to need grace there as well. And of his fullness, grace upon grace grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, if God did not send his son Jesus, we would never have an accurate and complete picture of who he really is. We would be arguing with each other about different things. And was the, was the Old Testament church, did they argue about who God was? Absolutely. And I would argue that we, we do the same, but the truth is we shouldn't argue because every time we look in, in Jesus' life, every time we study his life, every time we study about how he deals with people, what you're really studying is who God is, how he really feels. Dear ones, sometimes I know weird things happen, tough things happen, storms come out of the blue, you know what I mean? And you feel like, God, are you listening? Are you there? I shared the story last week when, with, with Tree and I. It didn't seem like God was fair. Other people can have kids, and yet we can't. What, what's the fairness in this, God? Right? And yet God is like, Ben, you're going to have questions for me, but I have the answer. I'm going to send him in the person of Jesus Christ. Study his life, and you'll discover how I really feel about you, how, who I really am. And you'll realize that it's true that God is not fair. He's actually gracious. If he was fair, I wouldn't be standing here today. If he was fair, you wouldn't be sitting there today. Amen? If God was fair, doesn't the Bible say the wages of sin is what? And yet, breathe in. That's grace, brothers and sisters. <laughs> How many of us have, are guilty of sin? So we should have a death penalty. Why has, it been, why has that death penalty not been carried out? Because Jesus says, give them a chance to trust me. Amen? When you breathe this side of heaven, this side of the cross, you're breathing in grace. Brothers and sisters, don't believe me. Believe the Bible, not just John. Come with me to Colossians. We're going to look at a couple verses. When we study the life of Jesus, we're not just studying the, the ministry of an itinerant preacher. We're actually we're seeing something much bigger than that. And that's what John is trying to say. John, in John's day, people weren't sure who Jesus was. Was he John the Baptist? Was he... Was he the, you know, is he some special prophet? Is he just a healer? And John is trying to say, no, he is the one I'm not even worthy to touch the sandal. He is God. The word became flesh. He's the creator. He's, he was there. He was always there. He never had a beginning. Look at Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, 
For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, what? Bodily. Do you want to know what the Holy Spirit's like? Do you want to know what God the Father is like? Study the life of Jesus. God has given the world a testimony of who he really is. You know, brothers and sisters, long before Jesus came, Satan entered the Garden of Eden and convinced human beings that God could not be trusted. Is that fair? And sin entered the world, death entered the world, and mankind has been kind of on the fence about God pretty much ever since. When we are born, do we trust the Lord right out of the gate? Do your kids sing praises to the Lord, and naturally when they, when they get their first uh, allowance, they're like, I want to give a tithe. <laughs> no? Your kids aren't like that? No, we're, we're, we're naturally very distrusting, and we don't, we don't trust this, this person called God. And in fact, it's gotten so bad that we have theories and, 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 and philosophies that God doesn't even exist. That we just all appeared here one day. And people believe that. Because people don't naturally trust the concept of a creator God. And so the Bible says here in uh, second, second, uh, Colossians, or Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God wanted to give a representative that could truly, 110%, show the world once again, remind the world once again, who he is and what he's really like. Look at John 14. Come with me to John 14. We're just going to look at a couple verses. John 14 and verses 8 through 10. Philip, one of Jesus' own disciples, said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Philip was thinking, listen, all I want to see as a disciple, I want to see God, right? I want to see the Father, and this is what Jesus says to him. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is trying to say to Philip, Listen, when you talk to me, you're talking to him. Amen? When you see me, you're seeing him. When you hear me, you're hearing him. I am, in the, in, 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 this, of Jesus, I am the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you want to know what God is like? Study the life of Jesus. Do you want to know how God really feels about you? Study the life of Jesus. And you're going to be hard-pressed to find people that Jesus does not love. They don't exist. Even the Pharisees, who were so difficult, Jesus labored long with them. He labored long with them. Brothers and sisters, come with me to another passage. John 1, 2 through 3. I want to show you something. And this is in reference to the verse... Uh, verse uh, 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says in, for, in John uh, 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. One of the things that John is very careful to, to point out is that Jesus is not a created being. He's not a created being. That Jesus, so h let me ask you a question. If, if I built a Lego set and nothing on the table was created apart from me, I created everything on the table, am I also created on the table? No. <laughs> I'm not Legos, right? Right? I pre-existed. Now, if, if the Bible says that, that everything was created after he was created, well, then that means Jesus was a created being. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that nothing was created apart from him that was created, meaning he was outside creation already. Brothers and sisters, we can trust the testimony of Jesus. He's not, he's not just a, another prophet. He's not just another Moses or Noah. He's not just another apostle. He is God himself. If you want to know whether or not God is worthy of your worship, worthy of your trust, worthy of your, of your hopes and your dreams, study the life of Christ. Come with me to John chapter 1 again, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Do you remember there was somebody who saw a part of God? Remember Moses? What part, did, what part of Moses, or God did Moses see? So, so Moses was hidden in a rock, and, he was, and God put his hand over him, and he passed by him just so that he could see, not his face, not, his, not all the glory, but just, just the, the, the back of him, right? And, and because of that, Moses came down from the mountain, and his face glowed so much so that they asked him to wear a veil. It was uncomfortable to talk to Moses because he'd seen 
more than most of God. But brothers and sisters, that wasn't enough for the human family. Today, when we, when we are going, when we're beginning in the journey of studying the book of John, I want you to understand something about this book. The Gospel of John was designed to give your family the evidence it needs to know God. The Gospel of John was written so that you and I could have evidence that we can trust in, that we can hold and, and carry in our hearts and carry in our minds. And when people ask us, well, why do you trust God? We can go back to the book, the book of John and say, well, because Jesus is God, and this is who he is, this is what he does, and that's enough for me. Amen? Dear ones, there's a portion of the story of Jim Elliot that I had, I had forgotten, I'd forgotten all about. When Jim Elliot and his friends were killed, around that same time, I don't know if it was, if it was Mr. Saint's, uh, if it was his son, I can't remember which father it was, but one of the fathers, I don't believe it was Elliot's father, came down and with local authorities found this murderous tribe shortly after the passing of his son. And, and you would think, if you were the father of a, of a boy in a family who went down to live among savages, they savagely killed them, what would you say to them? What would you want to say? When I think about my son being murdered, I cannot imagine what I'd want to say. It wouldn't be anything good. But the father went down, traveled down to Ecuador, went with the local authorities, and then they found the, 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 the tribe, the, the Aka Indian, that they believed was responsible for spearing his own son. And you know what the father did? The father embraced him, hugged him, held him, and said, in Jesus' name, I love you. In Jesus' name, I love you. There's another father who sent his son to live among the savages. And he moved among us. He dwelt among us. And he didn't even celebrate his 34th birthday because we were so sinful and wicked and jealous and angry. And the, between the Romans and the Jews and the believers, even his own disciples, they all abandoned him or actively mistrialed him and then nailed him to a cross. And you know what God said? God, he raised his son back to life. And, and when the son comes back, he doesn't, doesn't have hurtful words to say to the people who killed him. God, in Jesus, says, in Jesus' name, I love you. In Jesus' name, I forgive you for murdering my son. I knew what was going to happen when I sent my son. This was part of the plan. Jim Elliot's wife moved among and dwelt among and lived among the Harani people. Those people love Jesus because of the plan of salvation. The very murder of her, of her child's father and her husband they, when, that, when that tribe was sick and someone could have easily said, hey, listen, these people deserve what's coming to them. They murdered people who were there to help them. Instead, they said, in Jesus' name, we love you. And they, they worked for them. They sacrificed for them. And they helped them. And guess what? Maybe there's other tribes in the world that don't know Jesus. But it cannot be said of the Aka people anymore. The Aka people. And that, in jungle of Ecuador... God's love through Jim Elliot, his friends, accomplished the mission. Dear ones, it might be said that there is someone here in Charlotte County who doesn't know Jesus, right? But it shouldn't be said. <laughs> because we're here, amen? We're here. And, and by God's grace, the same love that moved Jim Elliot and that can, can move in us. And, that, and when people hurt us and harm us, cut us off in traffic, we can say, no matter what, instead of getting angry, we can say, in Jesus' name, I love you. Dear ones, it works. Every human being on earth was made with a need to be loved. And there's no love like God's love. People walking around in Charlotte County that don't know love, guess what? It, if, if, we, if we embrace this, if we embrace this God that's revealed in Jesus, and we let Jesus be Lord of our lives, people will respond to the, to the actions and the attitude and the words of his followers. They did in the Ecuador when they didn't even know the language. 
how much more in Charlotte County when we can speak the language. We dwell among these folks. Brothers and sisters, if you've got a spot empty next to the pew next to you, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray as a church family right now. We're going to pray for these empty spots in this church. There are people in Charlotte County who Jesus loves. Amen? And there are people in Charlotte County who don't know that they can trust God, who don't know that God loves them so much because they've never studied the life of Christ. But we're going to commit to studying the life of Christ, focusing on Jesus, and we, we're going to pray right now for these empty spots in these pews that God would send us. Maybe not to the jungles of Ecuador. Maybe it's enough just to go to the backyard of our own neighbors and friends. Amen? And we're going to commit our lives to Jesus like the Elliot said. We're going we're to study the life of Christ, and we're going to believe that when we study Jesus, people are going to start understanding that, you know what? That's who God is. That's how he is. That's what I need in my life. How many of you need a gracious God in your life? How many of you need a loving God who never sleeps and never slumbers watching over yours and your, your family? Amen? How many of you need to be able to say, you know, tomorrow I do a funeral for a, a little girl, and I am so grateful that I can, go to that, I can go to that service, and I can say these words. <laughs> Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen? Amen? That I can say these words with confidence, that just like Jesus raised the little girl, the, 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 the Jairus' daughter, Jesus one day will say, Talitha Kumi, little girl, rise up. Amen? Amen? We need this God in our lives. We were never meant to live apart from him. We were never meant to try to do life on our own. And these empty spots are people in Charlotte County that need Jesus. Will you pray with me? Is there anyone else? Tracy, I know you raised your hand earlier. Is there anyone else who realizes, you know what, Pastor, I, I'm here, but my heart wants to go all the way with the Lord, amen? I want to commit my life to Christ. Is there anyone who's heard enough evidence already in just a couple sermons focusing on the life of Christ, you realize if this God wants to, 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 to accept me into his family, his everlasting eternal family, I want to accept that invitation. Is there anyone here today ready to make? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask um, Brother Wave, make sure to, or Ed, make sure to get some information. Praise the Lord. Is there anyone else who realizes, I see a hand. Amen. Amen. Dear ones, I don't know how long we have on this earth, but I want to be like Jim Elliot. I want to go to whatever part of the world he sends me, God sends me to, and show people, in Jesus' name, I love you. In Jesus' name, no matter what, he is what you need, he's what I need. Let me pray for us, let me pray for these spots. And if, when, when I'm praying, if there's an empty spot next to you, right to your or right or left, maybe, it's a, maybe there's a loved one that should be sitting beside you, I don't know. Let's pray. I'm going to invite you in this prayer to pray together. Oh, loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for Thanksgiving. We're so grateful for the family time. We're so grateful for this worship service. We're so grateful to be able to study your word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, that, that statement right there should blow our minds that you love us so much that you would send your son, your perfect son, who's, who, no fault of his own, we chose to follow Satan. He didn't do anything. He warned us of what would happen. He told us about death, and we did not listen. And yet, instead of watching us just suffer our consequences, he becomes flesh, and he suffers along with us and pays the ultimate price. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray for every empty spot in this church. Lord, I pray for this pastor, and I pray for this church, that we would have the love of God, that as we study the life of Jesus, that he would fill us, that the fullness of God that dwells in him bodily will, by extension, his, through his promises, dwell in us. Help our family members to see Jesus, to see God in us. Help our neighbors to see God in us. Lord, when we would otherwise treat everyone, I mean, the Aka people, I'm sure there's reasons why they killed every outsider. I'm sure there's reasons why our neighbors don't want to hear about, about religion and about God. But Lord, you have a way of winning the people who are so hurt and so, so angry that they, they literally would, would kill you as soon as look at you. You can win those folks. Heavenly Father, forgive us for not loving like you love. Forgive us for holding back and keeping this treasure to ourselves. Please, Lord Jesus, I pray for the empty spots in this church. Not because we want this church to be full as if that's the goal, but I want all of Charlotte County to know that they can trust God. That the, 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 the Jesus, the record of Jesus in the book of John is an accurate picture of who you really are. You're God of great love. You're God that makes promises and then seals those promises with your own blood. 
You're an amazing God. I love you. I trust you. And I pray, Father, for empty, every empty spot in this church may be full of people who accept the invitation in Jesus' name. I love you. And then they have the ability in time as they understand more about who Jesus is, to turn around to the people in their lives, maybe even the people who hurt them, and be able to say, in Jesus' name, I love you. I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. And I believe we're about to sing a song.